theme of the book of Joshua is, anybody remember? A walk in the Spirit. Yeah. A walk in the Spirit. So, this is where the children of Israel, going into the promised land, they're going to be conquering their enemies. God is going to be empowering them. He's going to be fighting for them. They've already crossed over the Jordan. Now, they're about to take Jericho. Now, they have to take Jericho on their way through from east to west because Jericho is really the first city that they will encounter. And if they don't attack Jericho, then if they go around it, then their enemies can attack them from the rear. So they have to actually um, take out Jericho. God told them, I want you to take this city out first. Now, um, we're going to just pick it up in verse 1. And basically, we're going to go down to the end of the chapter, making a few points here and there, and then we're going to go back and focus on one particular verse for our main topic in our discussion tonight. So, look in verse 1 with me of Joshua 6. Now, Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I've given Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all you men of war. You shall go around, you shall, you shall go all around the city once. This you, sh- you shall do six days. And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. It shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout, then the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, every man straight before him. So Jericho was shut up securely because of the children of Israel. Now you remember that Rahab, the harlot, when the spies went up there and she lodged them, she said, we are all afraid of you because we have heard what you did on the other side of the Jordan. We heard how God fought for you against the Pharaoh and then against Og, king of Bashan, and Sihon, king of the Sidonians. He says, you know, we're, we're just, our knees are shaking. We're so afraid of you, she said. So, they knew that they were kind of nearby, they were in the land, and so they shut the gates, securely shut to keep them out. Now what I find interesting is we read in the New Testament about gates that are shut that Jesus said would not prevail. Remember in in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus took the disciples up to Caesarea Philippi, kind of northern, uh, in the Galilee area. And he asked them a question. He says, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Well, some say that you're John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And then he said, Okay, great, that's public opinion, but who do you say that I am? Who do you personally say that I am? And this is a really important question. Every single one of us has to answer that question. We kind of know the public opinion about Jesus, but who do we say that Jesus is? And do you remember that Peter spoke up and he said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus goes, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father is in heaven. Nobody told you this, but my Father in heaven revealed it to you. He said, And you shall be called Peter. Peter. And upon this rock I'll build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. How interesting. So here we have gates that are keeping the children of Israel out. There Jesus says, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Now, sometimes we think, and we've applied this, and in fact I've applied it like this. We've said, 
We look through church history and we realize the church has never failed to be a church. It's always existed. And therefore, the gates of hell, hell, hell have not prevailed against the church. In other words, Satan has not conquered the church. But I don't actually think it means that. Because gates don't attack. Gates just guard and gates keep imprisoned. So what Jesus is referring to, I believe, in that passage is simply this. That the gates of hell, the imprisonment that Satan has people in, and people who are, are, are sinners are slaves to sin. He keeps them enslaved. But the gospel is more powerful than the gates of hell. It will not prevail against the church. Paul said it like this. In Romans 1.16, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. It's the power of God. So, Jesus came to set the captives free. He came to open the gates of the prison that Satan kept people bound in. Those gates will not prevail. And neither will these gates or walls prevail against the children of Israel. One is to guard against, but another one is to protect, sorry, to to keep enslaved. The gates of hell keep people enslaved. Now, he told them, I want you to go first with our men leading the Ark of the Covenant. So the priests were carrying the Ark of the Covenant, but our men were to go first before the Ark of the Covenant, and then behind them, the rest of the group came, the rear guard. So this is interesting, because when they went into the Jordan River, you remember it was the Ark that led them in. God saying, I'm going to lead you into the promised land. I'm going to go first. But now, he says, before the ark, I want you to send the warriors. And what this represents is judgment coming. The sword of judgment is the army of the nation of Israel at this time. God is going to use this army as his sword of judgment upon these wicked nations in this land. That's why the warriors, I believe, are going first. Notice what tactic he uses as well. God says, okay, march around the city once a day for six days. And on the seventh day, I want you to march around it seven times. Or is it six times? I forget what I just read. Yeah, seven times. Blow the trumpets. And the walls of the city are just going to fall flat down. And you're going to be able to go straight up into it. What a military tactic this is. Who would have ever thought? It's totally, this is God who's going to do it. Verse 6, Then Joshua the son of Nun called the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord. And he said to the people, Proceed and march around the city and let him who is armed advance before the ark of the Lord. And so it was, when Joshua had spoken to the people, that the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Lord, before the Lord advanced and blew the trumpets, and the ark of the covenant of the Lord followed them. The armed men went before the priests who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard came after the ark, while the priests continued blowing the trumpets. Now Joshua had commanded the people, saying, You shall not shout or make any noise with your voice, nor shall a word proceed out of your mouth until the day I say to you, Shout, then you shall shout. And so he had the ark of the Lord circle the city, going around it once. Then they came into the camp and lodged in the camp. So they weren't to say a word as they were going around. Only the the priests were to blow these trumpets of ram's horns. So they weren't like brass trumpets. They, had, they were trumpets of horns. And the people were to be quiet. So this was quiet anticipation of God doing a work. They weren't to be riled up like a normal army would be with shouts until that one day when they could go in. Now, I think this is really important because they were not to engage in any way verbally with the enemy. 
So you can imagine they're walking around the city walls and the, and the people of the city of Jericho, or at least the soldiers, might have been saying things to them or per- perhaps the children of Israel would wanted to say, say something to them. And they were not to say a word. They were not to engage the enemy or say anything. Now, I want to make a point of application for us as Christians with our enemy, the devil. We're not to engage him in conversation. I see sometimes these guys um, on Christian television talking about how you know they're talking to the devil and they're rebuking Satan and they're, they're doing all this and basically having a conversation with the enemy. And we're not to do that. The enemy is a deceiver. He's a master liar. And he's, he's powerful. We, in and of ourselves, have no power against the enemy. But God does. And when we stand behind the Lord Jesus Christ, we're, we're powerful. Or He's powerful on our behalf. He can fight any battle. In the book of Jude, in verse 9, um, he talks about Michael the archangel disputing with the devil over the body of Moses. See, after Moses died, nobody really knows where his body was. And they think perhaps the devil would have wanted to get hold of his body and use it as some kind of um, idol for the people to worship because Moses was such a powerful leader. So God hid the body and the devil and Michael the archangel were were disputing about this body. By the way, God had a purpose for that body. He ends up in the promised land with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration with Elijah. So it says he didn't bring a reviling or railing accusation against the devil. He just said, the Lord rebuke you. Now this is Michael the archangel. There's no more powerful angel than Michael the archangel. And yet he said, not I rebuke you, but the Lord rebuke you. This is really important for us. We have no power against the enemy, but in Christ, when we're covered with the full armor of God, we are invincible. And we must not engage him in one-on-one combat, but only through Jesus. May the Lord rebuke you. So we stand behind the Lord. Verse 12. And Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord. Then seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord went on continually and blew the trumpets. And the armed men went before them, but the rear guard came after the ark of the Lord, while the priests continued blowing the trumpets. And the second day they marched around the city once and returned to the camp, and so they did six days. But it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early, about the dawning of the day, and marched around the city seven times in the same manner. On that day only they marched around the city seven times. And the seventh time it happened, when the priests blew the trumpets, that Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. Now the city shall be doomed by the Lord to destruction. It and all who are in it, only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all who are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And you, by all means, abstain from the accursed things, lest you become accursed when you take of the accursed things and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. But all the silver and gold and vessels of bronze and iron are consecrated to the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. And so the people shouted when the priest blew the trumpets. And it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat. Then the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. The wall fell down flat. This signals that God did this work. It wasn't the reverberation of a bunch of trumpets that caused this thing to fall down. I don't even believe it was a well-timed earthquake. 
Some scholars believe that because Jericho runs right along a fault line that runs up through the Mount of Olives all the way down to the Dead Sea. Um, and they think maybe there was this earthquake that happened at that time. I don't, if it was, it was certainly God's doing. But I just think God touched those walls and down they came. Now, it's interesting because archaeologists have dug up these walls. And you know the saying goes that every turn of the archaeologist's spade proves the Bible to be true. Well, Dr. Bryant Wood, the director of um, the Associates for Biblical Research, said this, What Kathleen Kenyon, John Garstang, and other excavators have found at Jericho correlates precisely with the account in the book of Joshua. Now, Kathleen Kenyon and John Garstang were British uh, archaeologists that dug there between the 1930s and the mid-1950s. He says, What they found in other excavators at Jericho correlates precisely with the account in the book of Joshua. He goes on to say, They found collapsed walls, not walls that were broken down from the outside, but that had fallen down. The wall had not fallen inward, but outward. Now you know that when they would build siege works against walled cities, they would break these walls down inward. These walls broke down outward. Creating a ramp of fallen bricks by which the Israelites, quote, went up into the city, every man straight before him. So you get the idea. Boom, down, there's just a ramp and they just went straight in. Also, the unusually large stores of carbonized grain found in the ruins showed that the city had endured only a short siege, which the Bible numbers at seven days, and that the grain had been recently harvested. Do you remember that Rahab had harvested flax on her roof right around that time? Also, because grain was a valuable commodity almost always plundered by conquering forces, the large amount of grain left in the ruins is puzzling but consistent with God's command that nothing in the city should be taken except valuable metals to be used for the treasury of the Lord, which we've just read in verse 24, or in verse 19. The city had also been burned exactly as the Bible records. This is really interesting. So, this is archaeology proving uh, what we're reading right here. Verse 21, And they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, ox and sheep and donkey, with, with the edge of the sword. Now we're going to come back to that verse. But Joshua had said to the two men who spied out the country, Go into the harlot's house, and from there bring out the woman and all that she has, as you swore to her. And the young men who, brought, who had been spies went in and brought her, out Rahab, her father, her mother, her brothers, and all that she had. So they brought out all her relatives and left them outside the camp of Israel. But they burned the city and all that was in it with fire. Only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. And Joshua spared Rahab the harlot, her father's household, and all that she had. And so she dwells in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Now this is a, an amazing picture for us of redemption. Here is this woman who lived just a terrible life of harlotry and idolatry. And yet she, at one point, saw the judgment of God upon the nations there and she put her faith in Yahweh. Jehovah, that is, the God of Israel. Not just God in a general sense, like Elohim of the Old Testament. That's a God in a general sense. This is Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God of Israel. She says, I believe that He is the only true God. <clears throat> and she was told, when we come in to this city to conquer it, you've got to put the scarlet cord on your window of your house. And we'll know not to 
to conquer and wipe this out. What's interesting about the archaeological dig that they did was they found one section of the wall that was left intact. It was the north section. And there were houses up against it. And in fact, they believed that was the slum area of Jericho. (laughs) So, it could very well be that that wall intact where her house was is still left there by the time they, they dug it up in the 1930s. Incredible. Well, this woman uh, turns up in the New Testament. You know when you're reading in, in uh, Matthew chapter 1, there's that genealogy of Jesus Christ and sometimes we just kind of skip over it. I encourage you to read through and check out some of the names in there, especially the women's names. They tell a story of redemption. You have in there Rahab marrying a man named Salmon. Salmon. Salmon? don't know how to pronounce that. S-A-L-M-A-N. Salmon. Okay. She becomes the great-great-grandmother of David. So she is marrying into the line of Messiah. Here's God allowing His name to be linked in with a former prostitute who becomes a believer and is saved. It's just amazing. I, I love that about God, how He how he includes sinners in in his life. Um, She turns up in Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of faith, and in James chapter 2, that part where it says, um, faith without works is dead. And so, listening there, what Rahab did, saying, you know, she didn't just have a said faith, a dead faith that's only in words, but she actually had a faith that acted and she hid the spies and it showed that she really believed. And she becomes a picture for us of, of Gentiles being saved because she wasn't Jewish. You ever wonder if Gentiles could be saved in the Old Testament? Well, they certainly could. But here was the stipulation. They had to ascribe to faith in Jehovah God in the covenant-keeping God of Israel. And that's how they became saved. Well, then Joshua charged them at that time, saying, Cursed be the man before the Lord who rises up and builds this city, Jericho. He shall lay its foundation with his firstborn, and with his youngest he shall set up its gates. And so the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame spread throughout all the country. Well, there's a curse on anyone who tries to rebuild this city. I want you to turn over with me to 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 34. We're going to see this curse coming true. 1 Kings 16, 34. This was in the days of Ahab, that wicked king who was married to Jezebel who was the daughter of the king of the Sidonians and um, she was basically pulling his strings. So, 1 Kings 16.34 says, In his days, that is, in the days of Ahab, Hiel of Bethel built Jericho. He laid its foundation with Abiram, his firstborn, and with his youngest son, Segub, he set up its gates according to the word of the Lord which he had spoken through Joshua the son of Nun. Now, this either means that they died during the building process or that he actually had them sacrificed and their bones laid in the foundation of this rebuilding work which often happened in the land of Canaan in in this time. They would do this kind of thing. And so we see here, it looks like perhaps Ahab had this man go and try to rebuild it, almost to flaunt, hey, we don't have to listen to what God said through Joshua back in Joshua 6.26. Forget that. This is a new thing we're doing here. And he has this guy try to rebuild, but the prophecy came true. So Joshua's 
fame spread. Now, let's go back as we close to verse 21. And they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, ox and sheep and donkey with the edge of the sword. Total destruction. And the question that I want to ask is, why did this happen? I want to also ask this question. How could God command this Israelite army to destroy these people? How could God even command them to destroy women and children? How could He do that? These are difficult questions and a lot of people, a lot of people that look at the Bible, they look at Christianity, they look at, the, they say, well, the, the God of the Old Testament is God of wrath, the God of the New Testament is God of love, as if they're two separate gods and they just wonder, how could God do this? And it's a legitimate question and I think that we need to, to look at it. First of all, the God of the New Testament and the God of the Old Testament are the same God. God doesn't change. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. God is eternal, which means He's outside of time. It means He cannot change. I, the Lord, the Bible says, change not. Change is a product of time. And since God is not bound by time, He created time, He doesn't change. So the same God that commanded the, the Jews to do this is the same God who became a man and died on the cross 1,500 years later. I also want you to see something about the people that he's commanding them to, to wipe out. The Canaanites were not innocent people. Turn over with me to Leviticus chapter 18. We sometimes get the image that these people were just living very peaceably, very quiet lives, you know, just very good people, and then God told them, uh, the Jews, to go in and wipe them out just for no good reason. But Leviticus chapter 18 just gives some laws that the, the Jews were supposed to keep when they went into the land. And as you read through these laws, you're going to notice a lot of detail about some sordid things. And you kind of wonder, why on earth would God tell them not to do some of these things? This seems very clear. It's, it's sinful. But he goes on to say, the reason why I don't want you doing these is because all of these things that I'm forbidding you to do are the things that these nations are doing in that land. Read with me. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. According to the doings of the land of Egypt where you dwelt, you shall not do. And according to the doings of the land of Canaan where I am bringing you, you shall not do. Nor shall you walk in their ordinances. You shall observe my judgments and keep my ordinances to walk in them. I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments. Which if a man does, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. None of you shall approach anyone who is near of kin to him to uncover his nakedness. I am the Lord. The nakedness of your father or the nakedness of your mother you shall not uncover. She is your mother. You shall not uncover her nakedness. And he, he will go on giving laws against incest. Now up to this point, there were no laws against incest. Because up to this point, the gene pool had not been sufficiently corrupted from the time of creation, but now it is. And so it becomes a very dangerous thing to have close relations w with a relative, um, sexual relations, because the offspring um, would be deformed. 
So he forbids it, but this is the kind of thing that was happening rampantly in the land of Canaan. So he goes through quite a lot of um, incest laws. Now, go down with me to um, verse 20. You shall not lie carnally with your neighbor's wife to defile yourself with her. So this is speaking of adultery. This, is, this was rampant in the land of Canaan. Now we might think, oh, well, okay, those things, you know, they're bad, but they're not too bad. Well, he goes on. And you shall not let any of your descendants pass through the fire to Molech, nor, you, nor shall you profane the name of the Lord your God, the name of your God, I am the Lord. Some of you may know what Molech was. Now, Molech was a god. A molten, what they would do is they would take this god that was shaped like this with hands outstretched and hollowed out in the, uh, underneath. And they would build a fire underneath um, this false god so that these hands became white hot. And then what they would do is they would take their babies and they would place their babies on the hands of Molech and they would burn these things to death as a sacrifice to this false god, Molech. Child sacrifice was happening in this land. Now God is the creator of life, not the creator of these, these kind of things. He, this is an aberration. God abhors this kind of stuff. But this is what was happening. He says, I don't want you to do that when you get there. He says also, Verse 22, you shall not lie with a male as with a female. It is an abomination. So this is speaking of homosexuality. God created man and woman, Adam and Eve, for the purpose of intimacy, of oneness, of unity, of being able to work together, and of procreation and sexual fulfillment. And so this is an abomination of what God has created. He goes on, Nor shall you mate with any animal to defile yourself with it. Nor shall any woman stand before an animal to mate with it. It is perversion. So this is speaking of bestiality. And this was happening in this land at that time. He says, Do not defile yourselves with any of these things, for by all these the nations are defiled, which I am casting out before you. For the land is defiled, therefore I visit the punishment of its inhabitants, of its iniquity upon it, and the land vomits out its inhabitants. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, and shall not commit any of these abominations, either any of, of your own nation or any stranger who dwells among you. For all these abominations the men of the land have done who were before you, and thus the land is defiled. Lest the land vomit you out also when you defile it, as it vomited the nations out that were before you. And I want you to notice what he says. For whoever commits any of these abominations, the persons who commit them shall be cut off from among their people. They shall be put to death. Therefore, you shall keep my ordinance so that you do not commit any of these abominable customs which were committed before you and that you do not defile yourselves by them. I am the Lord your God. So, please remember this. That these nations were not innocent, but they were really wicked. And God had given them 400 years to turn around and repent. You remember Genesis chapter 15 that we read uh, last week and the week before? where God said the iniquity of the Amorites, that is the Canaanite nations, is not yet complete, but will be after you've been here, uh, been uh, in Egypt for four generations. Abraham was about, 400, about 100 years old, so four generations, 400 years. They were in there for 430 years and then came out. God was very, very patient with them, waiting for them to get... Right, but they would not. So, they weren't innocent. 
Another thing about this is, God is just. And one of the things that we, we love about God is the fact that He is a loving and gracious God. But we're not so comfortable with the fact that God is a just God. But if God is to be perfect, and He is, then He's also just. And in His justice, He must punish sin. Even though He's very patient with people, um, judgment must come. In fact, everything in the world must come into the conformity with God's justice. His perfect will. You see this in natural law. If you break the law of gravity, let's say you, you go up on the Empire State Building and you jump off the top of the building and you're flapping your wings and you say, I don't believe in the law of gravity. I don't believe in... Well, you can say that all the way down, but soon you're going to find out that the law of gravity can't be broken like that. Everything comes into the conformity with God's will. God has natural laws that can't be broken, but God also has moral laws that can't be broken. Everything will come in line with His moral law. There will be a reckoning, a judgment. And so here, this is what we're seeing, even though He's, he's given them a long time to repent. As a matter of fact, if you struggle with the judgment of God, read through the book of Revelation. Because here we are on the earth, we're thinking about God is in heaven judging the earth, and we think, oh, I don't quite like that. But when God, in the book of Revelation, pours out wrath on the Christ-rejecting world, all those who are closest around Him in, in the, near the throne, they never question His righteous judgment. And in fact, they say, true and righteous are your judgments. Your ways are past finding out. You are always right to pour out judgment. So Israel here becomes the sword of God's judgment. But he told them, if you do the same thing, you're going to be judged. So don't think that you're holier than thou. You're not. You're just being used by me to judge these nations because of what wickedness they've done. And I've said before that God is patient. He waited 400 years. God tells us in Ezekiel 18, verse 23, Do you think that I like to see wicked people die? Says the Sovereign Lord. Of course not. I want them to turn from their wicked ways and live. God takes no pleasure in pouring out judgment on people and, and death on people. He doesn't. But God is just. And so He must bring judgment. Also, there is perhaps um, a condition that each of these cities could meet which would have been an offer of peace. Now I want you to turn with me to the 11th chapter and verse 16. Joshua eleven sixteen. Thus Joshua took all this land, the mountain country, all the south, all the land of Goshen, the lowland, and the Jordan Plain, the mountains of Israel and its lowlands, from Mount Halak and the ascent to Seir, even as far as Baal Gad in the valley of Lebanon below Mount Hermon. He captured all their kings and struck them down and killed them. Joshua made, a war, made war a long time with all those kings. There was not a city that made peace with the children of Israel except the Hivites, the inhabitants of Gibeon, all the others they took in battle. Notice this. For it was of the Lord to harden their hearts that they should come against Israel in battle, that He might utterly destroy them and that they might receive no mercy, but that He might destroy them as the Lord had commanded Moses. So he says, there was, of all the cities, there was only one city that made peace with them. Now, Turn over with me to Deuteronomy chapter 20 and verse 10. He says, When you go near a city to fight against it, then proclaim an offer of peace to it. And it shall be that if they accept your offer of peace and open to you, then all the people who are found in it shall be placed under tribute to you and serve you. 
Now if the city will not make peace with you, but makes war against you, then you shall besiege it. And when the Lord your God delivers it into your hands, you shall strike every male in it with the edge of the sword. But the women, the little ones, the livestock, and all that is in the city, all its spoil, you shall plunder for yourself, and you shall eat the enemy's plunder which the Lord your God gives you. Notice this. Thus you shall do to all the cities which are very far from you, which are not of the cities of these nations, but of the cities of these peoples which... The Lord your God gives you as an inheritance. You shall let nothing that breathes remain alive, but you shall utterly destroy them, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, the Jebusite, just as the Lord your God has commanded you. Why? Verse 18, Lest they teach you to do according to all their abominations, which they have done for their gods, and you sin against the Lord your God. So this rule of of offering peace was specifically given for the nations that were not in the land of Canaan, but farther out. Now, when they came into the land, they they conquered Jericho, then they conquered another city, and then they conquered another city. And in that time, the people that wanted to leave could hear about these judgments and they could get up and leave. But it says they didn't want to. And the Lord confirmed the hardness of their heart. He strengthened their decision to fight against Israel. Do you remember that the Lord did that with Pharaoh when they were trying to bring the nation of Israel out? It says, the Pharaoh would not let them go and he hardened his heart. He hardened his heart. He hardened his heart. The first five plagues, he hardened his heart. On the sixth plague, it says, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. So Pharaoh hardened his heart, then the Lord confirmed his choice. And so we can see here that with these nations that had, you know, maybe uh, heard about the, the, the Jews coming in and, and they could have left, they hardened their hearts and they wanted to fight them. So God confirmed that. And then they were, they were to be wiped out. I think that any one of the people in this land could have done exactly what Rahab did and said, I believe in the Lord your God. Save me. And they would have been saved if they wanted to be. Now finally, let's look at this question. How could God command even to kill innocent children? This is the hardest one of all. And I want to say up front, I'm not sure that I have a sufficient answer for this. But I'm going to give you what I have found to be helpful for me as I've looked at this. First of all, God always does what's right. Genesis chapter 18, when God told Abraham, that he was going to wipe out Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember, Abraham began to plead with the Lord because he knew that his nephew, Lot, was in Sodom. And so he started bargaining with him. Lord, if there are 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, would you destroy it? He said, no, I won't destroy it for 50. Well, don't get upset with me, but what about if there are 45 people there? Would you destroy it for 45? No, I won't destroy it. If there are 45 righteous people, I won't destroy it. He said... Let me ask you another question. What about if there are 40 people in that city? Would you destroy it for 40 righteous people? I mean, clearly, you, being the judge of the earth, you will always do what is right. That was what Abraham said, and that's true. And so he went from 40 to 30 to 20, all the way down to 10, and he thought, surely there got to be at least 10 righteous people there, and there wasn't. There were, there were only... Four, three, how many? Three and a half? Yeah. Yeah, so so we've got uh, less than ten and, and so they were they were destroyed. But the, the God always does what is right. When I look at the cross of Jesus Christ and I see what God has done for me and for you, how he willingly became a man and died for us on the cross. When I see His character and nature through the cross, 
I give him the benefit of the doubt. When there are things that come up that I can't really explain, like this, what purpose did you have in this, God? How could you? I don't let my doubts overcome the things that I know to be true about God. I know that God always does what is right. I'm, I'm confident of that. Secondly, this should show us that our sins have consequences beyond ourselves. Sometimes we think, well, I, I just lied, or you know, somebody says, well, I, yeah, I've committed adultery, but it was just between me and that person. It doesn't affect anybody else. You know what? Our sins affect other people. And the, the sins of parents affect the, the children. They do. Um, some of you know who Jonathan Edwards was. He was a great um, Christian during the Great Awakening in America back in the 1700s. He was probably the smartest man ever born on American soil. Um, spoke several languages by the time he was 13 years old. Graduated from Yale University at 17. Just a brilliant man. Um, they did a study in 1900 of the descendants of Jonathan Edwards compared with the descendants of a man named Max Jukes. I'm going to read to you what this study found. A.E. Winship's A Study in Education and Heredity, 1900, illustrating the priority Jonathan and Sarah Edwards placed on training their children, revealed the Edwards descendants included one U.S. Vice President, three U.S. Senators, three governors, three mayors, 13 college presidents, 30 judges, 65 professors, 80 public office holders, 100 lawyers, and 100 missionaries. This same study, in 1900, examined the descendants of Max Jukes of New York. Born in 1720, Max was a hard drinker, idle, in other words, he didn't work, irreverent, and uneducated. His descendants included seven murderers, 60 thieves, 50 women of debauchery, that's a fancy word for saying uh, loose women, 130 other convicts, 310 paupers who combined spent 2,300 years in poorhouses and 400 physically wrecked by indulgent living. Max Jukes' descendants cost the state in 1900, or by 1900, $1,250,000. The point is that our sins have consequences to our children. And so we see this here in, in the case of, of the um, Canaanites. And then the last thing before we go into questions is this. Every one of those children went to heaven. There is an age of accountability. and That's individual to each child. But up until that age, there, there is the age of innocence when they, they can't understand the gospel or what they're doing. Uh, and so there's this age where if they die, I firmly believe that they go straight to be with the Lord. So these children who died, they immediately went to be with God. And so I think that's, it, it may take a little bit of the sting out of it. Um, it's certainly true. Uh, but in this lifetime, you see, that that is a very difficult thing that God called the children of Israel to do, to wipe out w women and children. So that, I give it my best shot. Maybe you guys have other comments you want to make about that, but why don't we just open it up to um, some discussion now. Do you um, have any comments or any questions regarding um, anything that we've read tonight?